Welcome, Welcome to the Moto Marketing Podcast, presented by Racer X, the podcast for moto industry professionals, entrepreneurs, and riders. If you want to grow your brand and business in today's digital first world, you have to know how to turn a stranger into a fan, turn a like into a customer. You have to know how to turn attention into dollars. This podcast is dedicated to keeping you in the know on real marketing tactics that work in the moto world so that you grow your business and help grow the sport. Get ready to learn from the very same marketing experts trusted by Racer X, Lucas Oil Pro Motocross, GNCC, and NBC Sports. They'll help you navigate the world of digital marketing for your moto brand. This is the Moto Marketing Podcast. Podcast. Presented by Racer X. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Moto Marketing Podcast. Hey, we got a marketing deep dive uh, for you today. We've had a request from folks that hit me up on Instagram asking marketing questions. And uh, my guest today is somebody that you've heard from, but goes a lot deeper into marketing than uh, we were able to go on his first episode. Before we get to that, I want to talk to you about a couple of those that support this show. Obviously, first and foremost, Racer X. I want to talk to you about their promo that they have going on right now. If you subscribe or renew today, you're going to get a free pair of Racer X undies. That still sounds weird for me to talk on a podcast about getting underwear, but I got mine in the mail yesterday. They're by Ethica. They're Racer X themed underwear. I mean, look, I'm a guy that like I have one brand that that's all I wear. I put these on Game Changer. It's what I'm going to start using from now on. It's a $56 value. You get them for just 30 bucks. They have men's, women's, youth sizes available. Um, I'm a size XL. You know, just I'm a bigger dude. It is what it is. Uh, in addition to underwear, let's talk about some of the things you can uh, check out in the August feature. They've got some really good stories. Back to reality. Um, coming out of the darkness of 2020, we entered the light of 2021 Lucas Oil Pro Motocross Championship with packed fence lines and plot lines to match. Uh, you can read that story. Um, you can read all things in badly uh, about Eli Tomac's departure from Monster Energy Kawasaki. Um, they say that things are still on good terms, but it brings back memories of some of the sport's bigger breakups. That's a, that's a super interesting story. Uh, look, subscribe, renew, check it out, support the guys that support this show, um, Weege, Mathis, Davey, uh, they have some great features in there. Also, Michelin Bicycle Tires. Uh, the Michelin name is synonymous with quality around the world, yet many who appreciate the performance of Michelin don't know that the first tire that Michelin made was actually a bicycle tire in 1891 when the Michelin brothers patented the first detachable bicycle beaded tire. Uh, Michelin is one of uh, the main supporters of my e-mountain bike team that competes in the GNCC e-mountain bike championship. We wrapped up a national title last week. Our rider um, Cooper Kneff is running the Michelin E Wild tires. In addition to those tires, they the, in addition to the E Wild tires, they have the Michelin Force AM2 tire, the Michelin Wild AM2. Uh, they also have BMX tires, the Pilot SX, the Pilot SX Slick. Just a lot of great things. If you're into moto, you're probably into cycling. Um, give them a shot; they're great, and everybody loves Randy Richardson. You can follow them on Instagram at Michelin Bicycle to learn more. All right, so. I'm excited to welcome back uh, my friend and and really my coach now, uh, Jay Cavanaugh from Rack Racing. And uh, Jay, we've been talking, you know, he said, hey, why don't we come on and, and kind of deep dive into marketing? And that's what we're going to do today. So I appreciate you coming back on with us. Sure. And I think what's going to make it fun is we're going to combine my background as like a mindset performance coach and the psychology portion of things with marketing. So some people call it buyer psychology, some people behavioral economics, but it's really cool because if you think about it, it's all about like, like how do you get someone to buy? Yeah. You know, what makes someone buy this product than another? And there's so many cool stories, uh, studies that have been done in this field. And we're going to share a couple of them today. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And by the way, that Racer X underwear, I realized the power of underwear is underrated yeah. and one thing that happened with me when i was a kid and i don't know if this happened to you but i remember when i was like maybe five six years old i got my first thing of like spider-man underwear and then like um i think it was superman and i just remember when i got that superman underwear on i would run into bed at night and i would launch what i believe <laughs> to be six to maybe seven feet from my bed and i feel like i never didn't land 
perfectly on my bed at night. So I think that Racer X underwear thing is only going to be a huge seller for people. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting my own. Yeah. The, the, the Ethica underwear, they're, it's no joke. I mean, I, you know, I've always seen them. I've never rocked them. Now I am. So, um, yeah, I'm probably overselling the thing. But, man, dude, it's, they're good. So, anyways... Um, you've got a, you've got a list and I do too. I have a, I have a list as well, but I'm going to kind of play off of, uh, you know, what you have lined up for us today, just as a heads up for everybody. This episode might be a two parter. We try to keep these to, you know, 30 to 40 minutes. This might be a two parter. So, um, Jay, I'm going to let you lead, man. Where do you want to start this thing? Sure. So, um, one of the key, key things that I always like to talk about, and just to give you a little bit of background on where I'm coming from, I used to do what's called conversion rate optimization. So what that means is my previous career was I would go to websites and figure out how do we convert more visitors into buyers. Yeah. And so I have a background more from a digital marketing perspective and uh, more so from like watching what people are doing actually on the site. And I'm even going to share some of the tools you can use to watch people on your site live, which is really, really cool and exciting. And, um, and use that knowledge and say, well, hey, people are 18% of people are clicking here, but you know, 29% are clicking here. Why is that? And it's getting into that whole thought process where when you start to look at where the percentages are and where you start to gain that knowledge of what people are doing in the end you can literally change your income yeah. to levels that i think people under appreciate under expect i mean a five to ten percent bump just by adding a photo um a 17 percent bump by maybe adding social proof you know there's so many little things that matter a lot and so right. we're going to cover some of them uh right now yeah, so CRO, as we call it in the biz, conversion rate optimization, that, that's something that we do for a lot of our clients. So when I heard Jay tell me before that he has experience in that, I was excited to dive in. And a very well-known uh, Moto client that is more in the visual side of, of things, I guess we can kind of leave it there. We did some CRO stuff for them a year ago, um, and we were able to increase their average order value by 67% off wow. of just changing some things around. So what, what Jay is going to talk about, and I'll kind of add to wherever I need, is if, if you do it and you do it right, um, can make a massive difference. So let's uh, let's rock and roll. Yeah, so I think one of the key things, just as a, as a more global general statement, is people need to realize that what drives someone to buy is emotion, not logic. Yeah. And so people will often buy based on emotion and then later validate that purchase based on you know logic but at first what pulls the trigger is emotion mm -hmm. so the key is you always want to say well how do i trigger emotion and so when we talk about triggering an emotion one thing that does not trigger an emotion is just talking about the features of a product you know our product offers this our product does that you know those are all important things and i'm not saying they don't have value i mean i need to know what you're selling me right but if you really just focus too heavily on the lack of personality, the lack of fun, and just the features, I want to know the benefits, but I want them to be in a way where I can use my imagination to get an emotional response and therefore have a deeper connection with the outcome that I would expect to benefit from if I purchase your product. So what would that be? Well, let's say we've seen Manscaped has come into our industry like I think it has many. Yeah, it was only and a matter of time. A, what's that? <laughs> it was only a matter of time, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> um, and it was funny because when they came in, I was like, wow, I wonder what their little strategy is here. And But but when you think about it, one thing that I've seen with some ads like that is you're not going to like, let's say I'm trying to sell a manscaper. I'm not going to sit there and say, well, here's the blade. Here's what it does. Everyone kind of knows what it does. But I'm more so going to focus on the emotion. Like, mm -hmm. hey, do you want to feel sexier? Do you want to feel more confident when you go out on that date tonight? You know, imagine how you would feel if, you know, and then fill in the blank from there, right? And so what you want to do is stop people for a moment and get them in their mind to almost imagine themselves using your product in a way that provides some sort of elevated emotion. And I think that's a key thing that sounds so simple 
And you might say, oh, yeah, that that makes sense. But the question is, are you really, truly doing it? And I think that that's a huge first lesson to learn is that. And I'm just curious, yeah. Luke, with you, where have you seen emotions play in with some of your clients uh, and how has that helped them? Yeah, so I think that uh, really comes into play our clients, I mean, what we sell is, hey, we're going to get you a trackable result. So a lot of times our clients want to get right to that. Okay, how can we start making money? And we have to kind of back them up and help them understand like, look, the way these campaigns are going to perform the best isn't just driving traffic, retargeting them and, and generating sales. we got to start with what we call an awareness campaign. And then we explain to them, that campaign is not designed to drive traffic or revenue. It's designed to get somebody's attention. And the way you're going to get their attention is exactly what you're talking about right now. It's that story. It's that making the emotional connection. Um, it's 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 helping people visualize where they can be. Or, you know, it's the really the best influencers and the influencer campaigns that do the best. It's those that make people <clears throat> realize, hey, I oh, I want to be like that. So with us, it's it's making sure that when we have these three-tiered campaigns, that it starts with the story. And that story isn't just the features and the benefit of this product. It's making you feel like you're part of that, like you're that character and, and or that you want to be that character and that you can relate. And that's when, that's when the attention really happens. And when you have their attention, then you mm -hmm. can walk them further through that, that funnel or that pipeline. Yeah. And I like that you brought up pipeline and funnel because a lot of times people don't realize that this could be a process. I mean, <clears throat> for you to get someone to buy, I mean, depending on what, what you're selling, it could be seven, 10, 20 touch points that you need with someone until they buy. I mean, yeah. I can tell you that the people that join up in my mindset performance coaching group, they often will DM me and say, Hey, listen, I've been following you for a long time now. Like that's always the beginning message. It's never like, Hey, I just watched one of your videos. I shouldn't say it never, but rarely it's usually the people are like, Hey, you've been resonating. My message you know, has resonated with them for a while. Yeah. So they have that KLT, right? the know, like, and trust. Right. So they know who I am. They know what I'm about. They like me only because they see the value that I provided. And then the trust is they maybe have taken some actions based on some of the uh, recommendations I've made. So now they hit on all three cylinders, the K, L, and the T, the know, like, and the trust. And that's usually at the point where you can now present an offer. And so I think sometimes to your point about the awareness campaign, I think sometimes people just go for the sale um, you know, immediately. Yeah. And, you know, as you know, you know, if you go on Tinder, you know, the first date, you always got to, you know, start slow, a hug, um, nothing more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. Man, I, shit, man, I, 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 don't, I, I don't, I've never been on, on Tinder beyond looking at it when it first came out to see if we could use it as a marketing tool. And we couldn't beyond that, I would get in trouble if I was on Tinder. So, uh, <laughs> I, I have nothing else to add to that because I don't, I don't know how, I don't know how it works. Um, oh, man, it's, it's, it's funny though, because, well, it's not funny. It's, it's interesting. You know, we're talking about the emotional side and, and the story and not moto related, but at the same time, everybody in moto knows this brand specialized bicycles. Um, they have done they've always done a really good job with creating a, uh, an emotional connection with their customers. But over the past 12 months with everything that's been going on in the African-American community and in, in all of that, they partnered up with some of the most talented athletes in cycling today um, are, it's a small group of minority athletes, um, African-American, Mexican, just uh, different uh, ethnicities. And they're led by a uh, two black brothers, Corey and Justin Williams. And they are the coolest, hippest things in road cycling, which is the exact opposite of what road cycling is. It's boring, rich white males the African-American community is not big in that and specialize as trying to drive some type of change in that, which I think is really cool. And the content that they've been creating because of that movement is, mm. man, it gets your attention and it has nothing to do with their bikes. But what's funny as a result, you've now got me drawn into this story of Justin Williams, who is the U S national champion. He's a Red Bull athlete. He shows up with like, he's just the coolest, hippest dude 
and he stands out from everybody and it's making I'm I'm noticing people wanting to look cooler, look hipper and those people are all unspecialized. So what's happening is this content that they're putting out is drawing you into this story and as a byproduct what's happening is is you want to buy their $13,000 bicycle, not Trek's $13,000 bicycle. All of that starts with Jay with what you were saying. It's it's that story, um, and sometimes it has nothing to do with you know the features of the product. It has nothing to do with the carbon fiber of the bike or whatever it is. It has to do with the story of that character. And that character in this scenario is is Justin Williams. I encourage people to look up specialized in Justin Williams. His team is called Legion of Los Angeles. Look up his stuff on YouTube because what they're doing is man, it's. It's it's inspiring from a business standpoint. Trying to do more stuff like that is is pretty is pretty cool. I don't know if you've seen any of that stuff or not, but it's, it's interesting. I haven't. Yeah, I haven't seen it, and I love it. And you know, because even like think about it, I'm drinking a sugar free Red Bull right now. Yep. Honestly, it tastes okay. Um, <laughs> I don't think it does anything to energize me. No. But their branding. Yes. You know, when I drink that, I kind of feel like I'll have one before I work out. I honestly do not think it does a thing to my body other than I think it does something to my mind. Like I feel like I am now a Red Bull athlete, you know? So it's completely driving my emotions. It maybe it gives me a 10% bump in my workout and it's all placebo effect. Like it's just branding, you know? But once again, to your point, it's, you know, it's the emotion behind it. It's the story behind it. It's me, you know, having Travis Pastrana's phone number and (laughs) texting him and teaming up with something that we did for Red Bull Straight Rhythm with a Tyler Bowers years ago and just like the emotions associated with this and the fact that I was, you know, associated with the Red Bull uh, event twice, it, like I have an emotional connection to this drink. I don't, yeah. there's nothing about it other than yeah. the emotion. Yeah. That's it. Same. I, 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 I drink a couple of those a week and, and I'll be honest, like caffeine wise, uh, an iced coffee does 10 times more for me than Red Bull does, but I drink it because I associate myself with the athletes that I see rocking the Red Bull helmets with, you know, uh, cycling athletes like Kate Courtney and all these. It, when I see that, I have this connection of it's kind of like you see somebody out that has a, a, a you know, a Fox shirt on or, or a seven shirt on. And you're like, oh, that's my people. He, he's a moto fan. When I see that drink, I'm like, yeah, that's my, that's 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 my people. That's that's brand connection. I mean, re- I think Red Bull is probably they've done the best job out of any company that I've ever seen in my life of create. I mean, it is, it's sugar water, but they're a network. (laughs) They have athletes. It's like what Red Bull has built off of making it a connection with, with people. It's, it's, it's enormous. I mean, they have the broadcasting rights to pretty much every cycling event, uh, in the world. And, uh, people forget they just sell energy drinks, but it's more than that. So, um, yeah. And it, Go ahead. And it's, and it's interesting too, you know, so if you say to yourself, all right, let's say I have a smaller brand. How do I build that emotional connection? Um, like you were saying, story is huge. Um, I know that there is a, um, there was an artist. Uh, I saw this painting one time and I looked at the painting and uh, it had, I don't remember how many likes or share, like whatever it was, I could tell on social media it, for some reason it had a ton of uh, interaction. And I'm like, it really honestly wasn't anything impressive, but it had one of those carousels where you can see what happens next. So I swiped the carousel and I found out who painted it, an elephant. (laughs) I'm like, (laughs) what? And I watched this elephant making the painting and within, I'm not kidding you, Luke, within three seconds, I'm like, I want that. I want that. I I had, was there any logic behind it? No, it was all emotion. I'm like, dude, an elephant painted that. Yeah. I want that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and, and and not only that, but think about it. So who painted it? The elephant. And then I believe a portion of the sales went to, you know, saving the elephants. I mean, brilliant, 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 brilliant. Like, I, how can you not want that? Yeah. And, and, and so with art, I always even tell artists, I go, don't sell your art sell your story, sell your about me page, you know, and, and I think people don't realize this, but the second most visited site um, page that you have on your website, second most visited page is your about us page. And um, you see it time and time again, people want to go to the about page. Why? Because they want to know about your story. What do you believe in? Because don't forget if my values, beliefs, and in, in what's important to me is in conflict with who you are, 
I'm out. Yeah, I'm out. Sure. You know, like if you were, I mean, you know, whatever your value is, right? Like even something as simple as, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the best example, but you get the point. Like when it comes to values, if, if my value is here and your value is here, I want to align with people with my value. So if I go to your about page and you are maybe um, pro gun, I don't know, you're a little aggressive, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And I'm more subtle, laid back and anti-gun, yep. you know, like black rifle coffee, let's say, well, I'm going to either, that's either going to bring me closer to you yeah. because I'm pro gun and pro what you're about, or it's going to repel me. But in a way, it's beautiful how they do that because they're, I'd rather bring people to me tighter that align with my values and then push others away. Because when you try to be something to everyone, you end up being nothing to no one. Yep, and 100%. so I think that's a huge thing. And so I think people need to not be afraid to speak your truth, speak your value, show your identity, show who you are. So I can see if I connect with you or not, yep. you know, Absolutely. and I think that's a huge thing. Hey, what else did you uh, have on your list that you we can dive sure. into? So one of the things that I really, really like is price anchoring. Price anchoring is something where you basically show two different prices and you can do three, two. If you do three prices, oftentimes people like to do the middle one. They don't want to do the high one because it's too expensive and they don't want the little one, the smallest number because sometimes it's inexpensive, but they want to go in between or Let's say, for example, you're selling something for $17. Well, $17, if you're telling me you want $17 of my money, I'm immediately kind of thinking, I'm a little apprehensive, I'm wondering what's going on. But if you put it next to something that is maybe $99, now all of a sudden, if I look at the $99 first, that's the anchor, right? Mm -hmm. So you wanna show the higher price item first. So people like to read from left to right. So let's say, for example, you have two products you put the $99, $99 product on the left. When I see the $17 one on the right, I say, oh, that's a bargain. Now, I'm only saying that because I'm comparing it to the anchor. Now, if there was not an anchor, what am I comparing it to? And so that's where price anchoring comes in. I even use that with my coaching program because my one-on-one -on -one coaching is very expensive. My group co coaching is very inexpensive. Right. I always tell people first, what my one-on-one -on -one coaching costs, then I tell them what my group coaching is. And before I did that, people were resistant to the price. Now they're just like, oh my God, that's like a bargain. Yeah. No, I, I love that technique. And we have uh, some of our clients that um, use that. We have some that don't. They have different models that work better for them. But I think that's something that I remember the first time I ever heard that uh, early in our, in our business um, venture and, and we tried it and we still to this day will use that on occasion um, because it does work. I think something similar to this kind of play off of this that, it, it, that your comment has made me think of is another way that you can get creative with how what you're doing with your pricing in, uh, in your marketing. Um, again, it just simply based off of who we are and what we do as a, as a company we drive traffic, we get attention, we drive traffic, and we turn that traffic and attention into trackable sales. Well, one of the first things we'll do, especially with a client that might have a new a newer product to market that people are a little hesitant to, to, to buy, but when you get them in, you can continue to sell them and you can retarget to them or market to people that look just like them. Um, we've done things with uh, free plus shipping. So, I mean, let's just say it's, it's Arma and let's say this thing is, um, you know, $40. Um, you can do a sample pack that is, you send them three different flavors and it's free plus shipping. And people are like, well, you're just giving stuff away. You are, but what you're gaining in return for that is the data. You have the email address, you might have their phone number. You have all these things that you can put back into your marketing plan to target them again and get them to buy or target their friends because they have the similar and same data. So different than what Jay's talking about, but still a strategy that's based off of how are you pricing your, your stuff? Um, I love the uh, the, the, the anchor pricing, because again, we, we use it and I will test it. Sometimes I, I don't use it at all. Sometimes I'll present 
three proposals to three different clients. One of them will use the anchor pricing. One of them, it's just, hey, here's the price. And then some it's, you know, we do a bundle pricing to where it's like, if you, if you purchase all of these products, um, you get this rate as opposed to this. And we kind of test and see what seems to be working. So I think at the very least, test, do it, what, you know, Jay, what you're talking about, see if that works try different things. I can tell you the thing that tends to not work the best is the same thing you've always done. And if your product costs 79 bucks and you've always said it's 79 bucks, well, you might be able to sell it for 179, but you don't know because you've never tested it. True. Yeah. And, and even if you have a $79 product that's on fire, try to come up with, if you can, a product that's maybe twice the price and yeah. put it next to it. You will sell more of the $79 product. Yeah. You know, and and one thing to kind of um, piggyback off of one comment you made is when we think about reciprocity. Reciprocity is when you do something for someone, they're more likely to do something back for you. If your new neighbor moves in and you bake them cookies and say, welcome to the neighborhood, you might find them mowing your lawn, you know, out of the goodness of their heart the next day. Yep. Um, they did a study uh, way back in the day with uh, Christmas cards where this guy did a study. He sent out 600 Christmas cards to people he didn't know. And he put his address on the back and all that. 200 people sent him a Christmas card back. <laughs> it's it, like, what that's are the awesome. odds? Like, that's yeah. literally what 30, 33 percent. Right. So. That goes to show that, and, and, and it's from a fundamental standpoint, because you think about it in, um, I don't know, just in humanity, we kind of need reciprocity for humanity to exist. You know, you do me a favor, I do one for you. The medicine man would fix you, and then you'd be the hunter and give him a, yeah. a deer meat, you know, yeah. venison. So, yeah. you know, this this is something that helped us in evolutionary ways. So yeah. it's really deep seated within us. Yep. And so always think of yourself as, you know, or think of where the opportunity is for you to give someone something. Um, here is a free PDF or here's a free video. Here are our top three secrets. Um, here's how to use our product. Here are three fun, crazy ways people use our product. Boom. You know, you've, you've hit me with the free You've hit me with fun and crazy, and I'm kind of curious. You sparked interest, maybe kicked in a little emotion to it. Now I want to watch and see that. And if you 100%. give me that, then I might want to return back. And they even have done that in betting. So in betting, I, I don't remember what company it was, but I think the ad said something like 100 free sleep with our bed for 100 free nights. And what they found is after 100 free nights, people felt so grateful that you let me borrow this bed for free for a hundred night, hundred nights, even if they didn't really like the bed and yeah. didn't really want it, they still bought it. Yeah. Butcher box does this, the, the, you know, organic grass fed, whatever over overpriced meat. Uh, I buy it myself. One of the things that they do is, and they've done this special for a long time, free bacon for life. You click on it, you're like, whoa. And then what it is, is if you sign up for one of their subscriptions, you're going to get everything that you order. Plus, they will give you free bacon for the life that you have a open account with them. And that alone, I mean, gets people to click. And then they're like, okay, it's so it's not necessarily completely free, but I get it. For, I get bacon in addition to everything else that I've ordered. Um, they've used it for years. And the reason they've used it for years is it works. So it's similar to what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I it is. And so one other thing I wanted to shift into, because this is my probably my favorite topic. I'm surprised I didn't start with this is think about the copy copy. If you if you told me that I needed to come to your website and you would give me ten thousand um, dollars towards whatever I want, the first place, the first place I would go is to copy the best bang for your buck is to hire a copywriter. However, with the caveat that you know the customer's speak, the customer's tone, the customer's voice. All too often I go to someone's site and it's the business's you know, tone is very business-like and professional. But I want you to talk to me because I'm, I'm a human being. Like talk to me in a way that I would talk to you if I met you at a party. You know, and so what happens a lot of times these businesses are trying to sell their products in this very sterile way, using words that are just a little stiff and businessy. But yet, if I was to meet the person that okayed and approved 
the website copy yeah. and I met them at a bar and was sitting next to them and said, hey, tell me what you do. Oh, I got this t-shirt company. Here's what it's about. I would probably want to buy their t-shirt. My guess is five to 10 times more just on that casual bar conversation than I would by visiting their copy. And so, you know, in one really great tip on this is look at what people write on like Amazon reviews. Like let's say for example, mm. you sold knives, right? Or well, we'll keep it moto related. So you're selling suspension. Okay. So what do you what are you really selling? You know, it when you sell suspension, to me, what you're selling to me really is the ability to go faster, to feel more confident, to feel smoother on the bike, to not feel the jumps as much or the bumps, you know, the kickers as much, whatever, right? You're selling speed, comfort, predictability, whatever it is, right? right. So you're not really selling suspension. And so go to like an Amazon review or go to a suspension site, wherever you can find anything on suspension and read the reviews. Oh man, you know, this suspension, I just really felt more in control of my bike. Boom want to feel more in control when riding question mark yeah then get a little yes momentum would you like to you know drop your lap times Heck yeah you know so you haven't even talked about suspension yet I haven't even used the word but now you've already got me uh emotionally committed you've got the copy that speaks the way that i speak boom you're gonna already at that point have a much higher likelihood of of converting me into a buyer yeah for sure and the, it's funny this is different but it, it's it's based off the same concept if you know what you're talking about is it's really a matter of um if people don't feel like you're talking the same language as them like it's going to turn them off and and we um we recently have and we were talking about this before we went live we're undergoing some new folks on our sales team and we've had some really talented people on our team but not all of them are necessarily moto centered so i had had to really be proactive as far as helping them understand the lingo so that they didn't jump on a call with with jay who's an avid moto fan and then jay realizes this person isn't talk in my language. He doesn't understand. You don't want your copy on your website to have that same negative effect, um, which is why, I mean, you, everybody heard me on the last couple episodes, we're looking for new account executives and we're looking for account executives in the space so that what they're saying resonates with who we work with. You want your copy to, to be worded the, the same way. And I think everybody can do a better job of that. Um, you don't necessarily want your copy to be that that suit and tie version of you unless you work in a space that it's very suit and tie oriented. I know there's some people who listen to this show that don't work in moto. So if you're in a suit and tie setting and it's very stuffy and boring, but it is what it is, your copy probably needs to be along those lines. If you're selling to Donnie Emler Jr., you don't want it to sound like it's John Smith in a suit and a tie writing that. I think that's what you're getting at, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, to expand upon this point, just to kind of put it into context, as far as even like what it would look like on a site. Well, if I go to a main page, um, let's say, for example, you had a betting company and part of what you sell, maybe, uh, or let's say a furniture company. So one area you're selling betting, the other you're selling kitchen stuff. Well, you're going to be talking to me in two different ways immediately try to segment me you know hey where how can i help you are you looking for a kitchen bedding or interior design like whatever right that is a beautiful way to get started because if you click on one of those three right from the home page boom now you're speaking my language now you're speaking my tone right. but sometimes people will not segment or businesses will not segment you early enough and it's in and they're speaking this general tone and once again like i said earlier if you're if you're speaking this general tone and you're not speaking directly to someone you're going to lose the conversion you're going to lose the the sale yeah. and so i think you need to also manage the segmentation part of it as well and and also you know calls to action <laughs> i am i am shocked i am always shocked and shocked and shocked at how just a simple change in a button the copy on a button. So just to be clear on what a button is, a button is, you know, if you're going to buy something like the buy now, like it's called a button, right? So um, you can also test just the copy yep. there 
And it is insane the differences you can get. You can get a 5, 10, 15% bump just by changing the word and not to mention the color. If the, a lot of times people do these things, um, oh, I forget, they call it like a ghost button. But a ghost button, it's not really easy to see it's a button. It doesn't even look like a button. Even if you just change from a ghost button, which is basically just a line in a box with copy in it and make it like a true solid button, or even manage the color, um, change the size of it, the positioning of it, yep. um, all of that alone can increase conversions. And so, you know, I think it's not, I understand it's not sexy, but one thing's for sure is test, 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 because you don't know what's going to sell. I know one guy who used to work at freeshipping.com. And at least that's, I don't know if it's still freeshipping.com now, but it was like 10 years ago. And he goes, do you want to know the craziest? I go, what's the craziest thing that happened? He was the web guy. He goes, the craziest thing that happened in our business is we redid the website because it looked antiquated. It was like, at the time, it was like a 1999 looking website, um, was converting well. Their business was a phenomenal business. And um, they redid the website and they were shocked. Mm. They got hit hard on conversions. It looked pretty, it looked amazing, it was great. But guess what? They did some research and they found out that because it was older and had that older look, it had the look that it had been around for a while. And so people were like, wow, I kind of trusted your site because it looked like it'd been around for a while. And it was just wild. They actually tested it. And so they took some of the elements from the old site and brought them to the new, but they dampened the amount of newness and coolness and freshness to the site. And then conversions went back up. Yeah, that's it. Man, conversion rate optimization, It while we have a... a, a you know, a team of people here that, that do it. And it's led by uh, a gentleman that's, he's the longest employee at my company. Uh, his name's Mike. He understands this stuff and he goes so deep into it. And some of the stuff he's seen, it's, it's just crazy stories like that. And actually you saying this and, and bringing up CRO makes me think I'm, this is kind of off the cuff. I had an ad read for impact, but I'm going to do something a little bit different. If, if you're hearing this and some of the stuff Jay's talking about and you're like, okay, this sounds cool. I have no idea how, like, again, I'm still trying to figure out what CRO is, what's conversion rate optimization. How the heck do I figure out what I need? If you email me, luke at thinkimpact.com, it's T-H-I-N-K-I-M-P-A-K-T.com, and uh, tell me you're interested in in a uh, conversion rate optimization audit. Um, I, I can only probably do it for no more than five. After that, it it gets overwhelming from Mike and his team. The first five people that email me that want us to do completely for free, look at your site, give you some ideas of some things that could help increase your conversion rate. I will personally set up a meeting with you, myself, and Mike. Um, Mike is not a salesperson. He's a web guru. So I promise you will not be sold on this, <laughs> on this call. Um, if that's helpful, then we're, I'm happy to do that. Also, before we dive back in, because we got about 10 minutes left, I want to give a shout out. I'd mentioned FMF and Donnie and Little D and all those guys. I want to give a shout out to them. Um, they've been nice enough for the last nine months to hook us up with a code. If you go to FMF um, in any of the apparel items you get, you type in the code MMP, as in Moto Marketing Podcast, MMP30. Uh, at checkout, you're going to save 30% on all FMF apparel. So I appreciate them uh, doing that for you guys. So um, Jay, we got about about 10 minutes left. Uh, I think we should do a part two because I have stuff we haven't even gotten to and I know you've got more. But to kind of wrap up part one of this, um, what do you think is a good talking point to kind of go out on? Um, so what I wanted to kind of go out on is a couple tools and a couple things that are like must do's um, that are simple, easy, but will give you a ton of information. Awesome. And all, But before I give those, I want to just say one thing. Conversion rate optimization, I'll just give you a very quick example. It pays for itself. I worked for a company that they, I'll just tell you the numbers, I don't care. They paid me 4,000 a month. I did on the side, didn't have to work that much. They charged a client $8,000 a month. So they made a gap of four. The client within the first month, I found one simple, ridiculously foolish, easy thing that I changed that made them an extra 20 grand a month. Yep. My point is this, not wow, look how good I am. It was, it paid for itself. The, the crazy thing about CRO is it's just like a good tax accountant or you know CPA. Yes. 
it pays for itself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so so you know, people are always thinking like, oh, how much does this cost? It costs you nothing. Yeah. Because you're yeah. probably gonna, if as long as there's enough traffic and the numbers make sense, you know, for a low traffic site, yes, it's harder because you need what we call uh, data that's significant, like significantly significant, like numbers enough where you need you need to have a thousand, ten thousand visitors to really get to that. Uh, that significant uh, conversion rate to see is this just by chance or is this statistically significant? Right. So just keep in mind when you talk about CRO, it pays for itself. But to back to the the final points I want to make, here are some tools that you can look into and some opportunities for you, two of which are free, one which is paid, but it's super inexpensive and well worth it and actually really interesting to, to play with. Three things. One, Google, Google Analytics. I know Google Analytics, it, once you open up the dashboard, you're like, what's going on? This is insane. It's overwhelming. It is a treasure trove of gold for you. Um, be familiar with Google Analytics. If you don't feel comfortable with it and you have a, you know, a, a business that's doing quite well, invest in going on somewhere like Upwork and look for someone or maybe Luke. Um, I'm assuming your CRO team could do it as well. Right. Um, look at the analytics. See what the data says because the data never lies. Now, one thing beyond that, so that's number one, is, is make sure your Google Analytics is set up. It's easy to do. Your web developer, developer can put a little bit of code on your site if it's not there. But for most of you, it's probably already there, but you're not looking at it enough. Get comfortable with that. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do that. I would reach out to Luke on that. Secondly, Google Search Console. Now, people often think Google Analytics is all there is. There's something called Google Search Console. Now, the number one thing there the number one opportunity there for you is the one thing that Google Analytics used to have way, way back in the day, but they removed it. But now it's in Google Search Console mm. is the ability to see what kind of query did someone type into Google to get to you. Mm -hmm. Now you've got the data that you can give to someone like Luke's team at Impact, you know, and just say, hey, um, our ads, most of our people are buying this and they're, they're, they're searching for this phrase. Let's use this phrase in our marketing. And there's so much you can do with that. Your copy, if you're doing an ad spend at RacerX, you know, uh, for a, a, an ad, like what all the copy is there waiting for you. So don't be afraid to look in the Google search console, which parallels and kind of links in with uh, Google Analytics. They're, they're, there's two separate things, but also similar. So um, your web developer uh, would be someone to reach out to in that. And then the third and final tool I wanted to offer you is something that I was addicted to, to the point where it was worse than my Red Bull, sugar-free Red Bull addiction. Um, it's called Hotjar. So yep. Hotjar. We use it here. And we didn't talk. It? We, yeah, we use it daily. We didn't talk about this before we jumped on. So you got two completely different experts. I, we use it here. And Jay swears by it too. So go ahead. It's it's an insane tool. It's so insane. And the cost is I don't remember the cost, but I I, I know for what you're paying, I think it's under it's it's an un, they're underselling themselves. Um, what it is, <clears throat> a couple of things you can do. The most incredible. I'll tell you the. I won't tell you all of them, but I'll tell you one. The one thing that is the most incredible thing that you can see is you can actually watch people either live or recorded go through your site. And you can see where are they clicking? Where are they stopping? Where's their attention going? And some of the the uh, the information you can gain from that is is unbelievable. And once again, the knowledge that you gain far exceeds the price and cost of the tool. And it's super simple to use. Um, and there's other things that I won't go into right now for the sake of time. But I'm telling you, Hotjar, your Google Analytics, Google Search Console, you know, information is power, you know. And so this these are the three tools that I recommend right out of the gate if you're not using them already. Yeah, um, we that I would say Hotjar is one of, if not the biggest aspects of when we do CRO uh, for a client and it freaks clients out in a good way when they're like, you can see this stuff. It's really cool. Um, I want to, I wanted to add, and we can dive deeper into this next time, but I did want to add, um, kind of top five. Uh, I get asked a lot about Facebook. So I want to dive in just very quickly. Uh, the top five, uh, I guess headlines, if you will, as far as things that you need to 
uh, do or consider when you're doing Facebook marketing, if you're doing it yourself or if you're looking for an agency, you need to ask them these questions. Number one, you shouldn't be boosting a Facebook post. That is a quick way for Facebook to get a dollar from you and you not really be able to make anything back. Bo boosting a post is not going to, uh, that's not a Facebook ad. Um, your campaign structure needs to be simple, but it, it needs to be more than just, I launched a Facebook ad. And, and we talked a little bit about this. You need to have an awareness campaign. You need to have a traffic campaign. You need to have a retargeting campaign. Awareness gets their attention. Traffic takes them to where you want them to go. Retargeting is like that car salesman, right? You go look at the Chevy Suburban. You don't buy it the first time and you leave. Well, that car salesman's probably going to call you and get you to come back and test drive it, maybe take it home for the evening. Mm -hmm. That's the retargeting campaign. Um, we're really pushing clients to do this now more than ever. Make your decisions based on profit, not ROAS, meaning return on ad spend. Facebook and Google and Apple are going through a lot of changes. The trackability is different than what it used to be to where you could track and see how much you made back on your ad spend. Due to privacy reasons, that game is changing. So we're really pushing our clients to look at profit. Um, one of the big race series that everybody is very familiar with that listens to this show, we do that with them. Um, look at how many tickets were sold once we launched the campaign, more so than what it's saying in the reporting dashboard because not everything is getting accounted for because of the latest iOS update. So look at profit as a whole more than just return on ad spend. Um, scale your ad spend when it's working. If you're spending $1,000 a month, try to spend 2000 a month or 5000 a month, but don't go from 1000 to 5000 It'll throw everything off. You need to scale at a certain percentage every single day. Um, don't get caught up in the creative on anything beyond the awareness campaign. Um, we have a lot of clients that are like, yeah, but this ad looks really cool. But the data shows that this ad is driving way more sales. Really quick example, uh, if we have an ad to sell let's just say tickets for the Lucas Oil Pro Motocross Series. Um, and we have an ad that is Cooper Webb signing an autograph for a kid and his dad, but uh, the promoter wants us the, to run the ad of Cooper Webb putting a block pass on one of his competitors because it looks cooler. The ad with Cooper Webb signing an autograph might not look as cool, but it sells more. Don't get caught up in the creative. So quit boosting post, campaign structure, make decisions based off of profit, not just ROAS, return on ad spend. Scale your ad spend appropriately and don't get super caught up in the creative. Go off of the data and the metrics. So um, let's take those five and kind of use that as a teaser for maybe next episode. I'd like to dive into that a little bit deeper um, with Jay as well as the other things that he has on his list. So um, let us know if you like this episode. Uh, DM uh, Jay. It's uh, Jay. Is it Rack? What's your Instagram? The best one for them? So Instagram is Rack Racing. So it's R-A-K Racing. Even though today's uh, pod podcast uh, was mostly you know, on marketing, I am a mindset performance coach. So what I normally do um, is help people get their mindset dialed so they become a better racer and also a happier human being. Yeah. Message him on his Instagram. Let him know if you enjoyed this. Message me. Um, we'll definitely do another one, but I'd love to get some questions from you all um, that maybe we can dive in uh, a little bit deeper for you. So I mean, this is fun. I, I enjoy nerding out over marketing on occasion <laughs> with folks. <laughs> so I appreciate Geeking out is on, fun, man. man. Yeah, man. You know, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, you just geek out a little bit, ride a little moto, you know? That's right. That's right. Hey man, it, it, it's, it genuinely, it's a pleasure. You're one of my favorite guests. I'm, you know, I'm getting to know you. I consider you a friend. I, I enjoy talking to you. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do it in person one of these days. And, uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah. And sorry, I missed you at high point, but guess what? We moved into a, a championship lead. So, um, we're now leading a championship that we did not expect to be leading. That was that last minute change in plans where you and I were going to have dinner yep. at High Point. So congrats, so that's just, awesome. Just letting you know, it did it did prove uh, to be a, an effective move. So thanks for uh, letting us reschedule that. That's awesome, man. Hey, it's uh, always a pleasure. If if you're listening to this, be sure to check it out on YouTube. You can see our, our handsome faces. If you're watching on YouTube, <laughs> uh, give yourself a break and uh, listen to us on the Racer X uh, iTunes channel. And uh, we'll catch you guys on the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Moto Marketing Podcast. If your goal is to get real, measurable results from your marketing that will grow your company revenue, 
Then check out how Impact Media can get the same results that they have for Moto's most iconic brands by visiting thinkimpact.com. That's T H I N K I M P A K T.com. Have a marketing question that you want answered on the show? Send your questions to questions at motomarketingpodcast.com. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. And we'll catch you on the next episode of the Moto Marketing Podcast.